Welcome to Behind the 90 with Nika podcast. We, this is a very important episode, as all episodes are important, but we feel, I felt like having a part two of overcoming abuse was very important. My special guest, Angie, has been gracious and brave enough to talk about her story. So I really felt that it was fitting to do a part two because we did not want to rush the episode. So this is a part two of overcoming abuse. And then we talk about the power control. We'll, we'll kind of add some of that in there here and there. But before I get Angie on, I want to talk about what the 90 means, behind the 90 means. 90% of what we go through in life is about our past, and only 10% is about the here and now. That 90% represents our story, how we move, how we think, how we do things, right? Whether it's good or bad, it really represents our story. So which makes it very important to tap into our stories, understanding a person's 90% before we start making judgment. So we have Angie back, and I'm so excited to have her back. Welcome mm-hmm. back, Angie. Part thank two. You. Yes, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be able to, you know, just dig deeper into the story and kind of just, once again, share my story so that it can help other men and women who may be dealing with this, you know, with abuse. Okay, well, so. thank you. So I think we, can you... I'm going to let you lead because I know we stopped at a certain point and I just want to make sure you give our listeners a full view and we don't want to miss anything. So can you start where we left off? Yes. So the part that we left off on would be the part where I was actually kicked out of the apartment. And now looking back, I guess I can say kicked out because I guess it was very nicely, please give back the key because this relationship isn't working out. So that's kind of where leaving off from the story of, you know, kind of journey, well, the journey after that, because technically he was just letting me know that this relationship isn't going to work and he wanted back the key. And if we, you know, later down the line, if we do work things out, then we may get back together, but it wasn't any guarantee pretty much. So you were open to that? Seeing that he kicked you out of a place that you guys came into together, mm-hmm. you were okay with the the possibility of coming back? And also considering that you had gone through so much abuse with him, mm-hmm. mental abuse. Mm-hmm. And when he said that, it almost as if, giving you the option, you know, if I want to get back with you, we'll give himself the option as if you would even consider that. Mm -hmm. But being in such an abusive relationship, sometimes we can kind of neglect ourselves and we can not necessarily see while we're in it, how abusive things are. So when he actually said that the possibility of you guys getting back together, was that even an option for you? I think in my head, it was just the fact of not wanting to turn back. It was like, I'm so deep in that if there's any form of saving this or any form of him changing, I was just willing because I didn't want to journey another relationship. I was so far in and hurt that it was like, I just want to make this work. You know, I'm willing to try to make this work. So I think part of me at that moment was like, just see, just see if this might come around, which I wanted to also mention two key points that also probably made me feel like there was hope. Even though he didn't meet my parents, I did meet his mom and his brother and his mother was Christian faith background. She also at the time too, because I had I was working like three jobs, going to school. So I was also working in retail. She would come and she would get her suits for church. We would go to dinner or lunch. And she just really had a liking for me and we had a connection. So I looked at it like seeing his mom having this faith background and seeing how she was, I'm like, there has to be some hope for him, you know? And which was also crazy because I never told her what her son was doing, you know, but it was like, 
seeing that he grew up with a mother who was caring, loving the Christian background, I'm like there is some form of hope. You know, I felt like there was some form of hope. And, you know, now thinking back on it, I could have reached out to her and told her, but I felt like if I would have disclosed what was going on, then it may have been something, you know, repercussions behind it. And I didn't want that to happen, you know, because I still had that form of love and care for him. So I kept it a secret, but yes, I knew his mother and his brother and built a relationship with them. So it was almost like there has to be some form of hope. Maybe things will turn around, you know? Okay. So, but, and you were in your early twenties. Yeah, I was right. Yeah. So in your early twenties, and again, we go back to what you were saying, because you had two parents that stayed together and I'm sure they weathered some storms. You didn't necessarily see those storms. You still had in mind your, your mindset was make it work, no matter yes. what, make it work, even if you're sacrificing yourself in some regard. Yes. Um, like you said, I think you said last time, a lot of times you went so far in those relationships, whether it's premarital sex or what have you, you felt like, I got to make this work. I've done all these things in this relationship. I don't want it to be a waste. Yeah. And it's not so much a waste. So when you look back on it, probably... If you had to do it all over, you probably would say, I need to leave this relationship when you start seeing the first red red flag. Yes, you would not have stayed. Absolutely. So it's not a function of that I hear you mention. And I think a lot of young people may feel that way. And I think that's a good point that you make. Oh, he comes from a nice Christian background and surely he can turn this around. You know, he's just maybe having some bad moments or what have you. And I think we can say that about a lot of people who are in the Christian faith. We put this this halo effect Mm -hmm. over people who are Christians as if, you know, that's the saving grace, Mm -hmm. right? But it's not always the saving grace, right? Mm -hmm. We would like to think that it is, but we recognize even Christians, sometimes they hide behind certain things. Absolutely. You know, you could be in an abusive relationship and you're Christian. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily think much of it because you're Christian. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, for young people, I can, for you being young at that time, I can see why you would have thought like, you know what, he comes from a Christian background. He got good stock. Yeah. He'll turn around. He'll be better. He has his faith. He has his, this strong, you know, woman of faith in his life. Yeah. He'll be better. So I can see why you probably would have at that age, mm-hmm. you know, because you haven't had that many experiences. So yeah. speak yeah. more to, can you speak more to the abuse? But like I said, because What would you say, Angie, was the thing that really kept you bound? Uh, Because when you experience an abusive situation, it can really impact you in a way that you're not making the best decisions for yourself. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you start to blame yourself. So can you speak more to the abuse? I definitely Mm -hmm. feel like it came to a point where it was like, I'm obligated to just stick it out. I know for sure I was scared in a lot of ways because I didn't know. And when we go deeper into the story, I just didn't know where he was coming from. Like after the whole situation of him starting to jump on me, then the, he would do this mode of like, we're play fighting, but he was really physically hitting me. And I had went to work one day with bruises and I just felt like, what is happening? Like, where, why are we? Because he had that way of kind of making it seem like it was okay. And then turning around like, oh, we just play fighting or we're just joking around. Like even with the situation with the iron. And I just looked at it like, no, it's something more to this. Like you're not playing. You're seriously like jumping on me, you're hitting me, you're abusing me, you're belittling me, you know, making me feel bad. I can't eat certain things. Like it was just a slow trickle effect. Well, happened really fast, but it was like a trickle down effect, you know? And I just was like, what is going on? Like the, the situation from when I first met him to everything was nice going out to dinner and us doing different activities and hanging with each other to now is this controlling, just all like a total night and day. It was mm-hmm. so, it was so crazy. I was like, what is happening? You know? Okay. So this yeah. again, this was before you moved out. Cause like they were going back now yeah, yeah. to really kind of get uh, some of the deeper. details mm-hmm. of the story. Yeah. So he made you believe that 
the the, the little uh, riffs that you guys would have and he, that he was playing with you? Or not making it serious. He would make it like, you know, he would say, you need to toughen up, stuff like that on the lines of that. But when he was hitting me or or quote unquote wrestling me or whatever he thought he was doing it clearly was an indication of no you're trying to get your aggression out and you're trying to show that you're you know because it could be in between like let's just say we might have had an argument or a disagreement and then this is how he's going to show that he has the upper hand and like I said, looking back then, I didn't notice it until now getting older and really digging deep. Cause I did a lot of journaling on, you know, just writing down the events and stuff like that. And I'm like, no, I was really in an abusive situation. Like it was real. And I, I kind of downplayed it because I thought, okay, this is just, you know, little things here or there, but no, it was really an abusive situation. And I'm like, no, this is a real thing. Like there's no belittling it. Like he's making you feel worse and worse every day, every you know? Yep. So when you yep. think about the first hit, think mm -hmm. about the first hit, do you recall what was the situation that triggered him to hit you the first time? To my understanding, we were just in the apartment. I don't think either one of us had to work that day. And we might have had like a slight disagreement because like I said, there was just in between, you know, certain things that he didn't like or, or certain things that I might have been doing. And then it just came to the point where we were in the guest bedroom and he just kept backing me into the wall, like, you know, trying to egg on a fight almost. So I really don't remember anything as far as maybe a slight disagreement. Now, what the disagreement could have been about, it was probably something that was minor. But mm -hmm. I remember going into the second bedroom and it was like, you know, you got to toughen up and blah, blah, blah. And then he just started wailing on me, just started hitting me, backing me into the wall, just hitting on me. And I was so confused of what was going on. I was like, what is the issue here? Like you're taking your aggression out on me. And like I said, the argument or the disagreement was probably very minor. Like it wasn't anything to go right. that extra mile for. But I remember going to work the next day and I felt horrible. And I was, I had bruises on my arm and right on my thigh and leg area was where I had the bruising at. Mm -hmm. And I remember wearing all black to work that day. And I couldn't tell nobody, you know, I couldn't say anything. It was like, who do you tell? You know, because at the end of the day, you still kind of like wanting to protect this person you still because you don't want abuser. to. Right. And then at the same time, I still have a apartment, you know, which will go deeper, but I'm still in this lease with this person. It's when you're lease. So it's like, it's so much in my mind that is like, what, you know, how did I find myself here? That's the question that I constantly ask myself. Like, what, what was I thinking? Because I never saw this in my family. I never saw this with my mom and dad. So how am I here? You know? Well, let me first start off by saying there's never, I know I said what triggered him. Yeah. There's never an excuse for a man or a woman to yes. hit anybody, you know, in a relationship. There's never an excuse. Why can't we use our words? I always yeah. say that. Use your words, use your words. So there's never an excuse to do that. And so it just sounds like it was like a, a power. When we talk about power and control, yes, the power and control, well, it was definitely something that he wanted to exalt power over you. Yes. He probably saw you as a lot of times people see kindness mm -hmm. as weakness mm -hmm. or just someone, again, that wants to be in a relationship. And he probably sensed that you were very much committed to him. Yes. But was he committed to you? Right. So he took it, it sounds like he took advantage of you for yes. the most part. Like you said, you didn't see abuse growing up. However, do you feel like you were taught boundaries in relationships. Like I said, there's a lot of examples that you saw from your parents. And this is not a blame your parents or anything, but did you have intentional conversations about this is how you need to be treated. And if you're not treated this way, you know, you should probably exit stage left. These are the red flags. And I think it's important that, you know, everyone has to identify with their own. Everybody has their own red flags, mm -hmm. right? What's a red flag to me may not be a red flag to you. What's a red flag to you may not be a red flag to me. But when it comes with issues of abuse, mm -hmm. whether it's mental, physical, uh, emotional, 
those are red flags. I, I can't imagine that not being red flags to anyone. So would you say there were ever any intentional conversations when you say to yourself, how did I find myself here? Mm-hmm. And again, this is not to blame anybody, but I feel like sometimes as parents, back in the day parents, I hate to say this, but it's I just know. the truth. <laughs> there know. aren't, there wasn't any real conversations Mm -hmm. around your wealth, how you should be treated. Mm -hmm. So was there any intentional conversation? Again, this is not to blame your parents, but is there any intentional conversations from your parents around how you should be treated in a relationship? What I, like I said, I think for me, it was more so there wasn't a direct conversation. There wasn't a direct, you need to set boundaries. And another thing that I want to also mention that I feel is very important is that between my mom and my dad, there wasn't really the part about like the, the actual showing affection or showing that like, I knew they loved each other for sure, Mm -hmm. but seeing how they act, like holding hands, hugging, maybe a kiss or two, you, I didn't see that. Mm -hmm. I I didn't really see that in a relationship. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, a lot of the example of what a relationship was, was taking care of the kids, making sure that you know, my mom had dinner prepared, making sure that clothes were washed, like kind of how I was mentioning before. And I feel like even seeing that example of how love was shown though, like a physical, like the physical touch or, or like I said, the hugs or kissing, I never saw that. So me navigating that other side of the relationship was like, I guess in my head, it was more so, well, I'm doing all the things, you know, I'm, I'm showing up with the half of my rent. I'm making sure that my apartment is clean. You know, I'm showing up in that way, but Mm -hmm. to actually know how love looked or how to see that side of it. Like I said, I never seen abuse with anybody in my family, but I don't think I really knew what love looked like on the physical end. Mm -hmm. And that could have been where the confusion was because had I seen a lot of the hugs and the gentle touch, maybe I would know that, Hey, this right here is not, you know, this, this right here is basically showing me that this is how you should hold a person. This is how you should hold their hand. This is how you should greet somebody when they come in the door, you know, because you're in a relationship with that person. So I think, like I said, I, it wasn't really any direct, understanding to boundaries or or what I need to to set it was more so on the mindset of you know find you a good man and 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 be married and have kids but it was no instruction no instruction instruction. booklet yeah Yeah. in terms of how I think that's I'm gonna be honest Mm -hmm. and this may offend people but you know what I I, I'm gonna say it Mm -hmm. I think when I have gone to when grown, not, well, I won't say growing up in church. My in my older experience with church, mm-hmm. one of the things that was one of the things of many things that was really pushed was finding a mate. Right, he who finds you finds a good thing. Yes. Right, so women who want to be in a relationship, we are tr- we want to find our good thing. Yes. for those who want to be married, so we feel like that's the end all be all. If you don't have a mate. Like you, it's almost like you don't exist, Mm -hmm. which we know that's not true. Mm -hmm. We know there's you. And then if you have a, if you bring on them, if a mate finds you, Hey, that's great. Mm -hmm. If that's what you want, but we still have purpose without a mate. Mm -hmm. Right. But I think sometimes the message is kind of like, you got to find a husband. You got to get a husband. You got to get married. You got to get married. And I get it. But in a, but they don't talk about, you know, again, they talk about being equally yoked, but it's yeah. usually in my mind is talking from the spiritual realm, yes. right? Yes. We don't talk about, you know, you need to figure out if this person, you know, mm-hmm. what their background is like, mm-hmm. because you can have the Christianity and you can be safe, filled with the Holy Ghost. However, if you have unresolved childhood traumas, is going to pour over into your relationship. So those are the things that need to be talked about. 
because that's not talked about mm -hmm. because again, it's, you know, it's kind of correlates to mental illness. And a lot of times we don't want to talk about mental illness. And a lot of people are working, walking around here mentally ill, mm -hmm. you know, have full, you know, full blown anxiety and depression. They're entering into relationships and they're projecting their frustrations and their anger mm -hmm. out onto that person, whether it's a female projecting her anger out onto a male or a male projecting their frustrations and onto a female. So, I think that's so very important that we talk about unresolved childhood trauma. Now, do we talk about that at the first date? We don't. But I think that's something that we should build community around talking about. If you got these issues, you may not want to get into a relationship if yes. you got some unresolved things. Yes. Yes. I love how you put that. That that is just the thing right there that is the thing and that's what i told myself especially for my platform was i want people to understand that the proper ways of dating and understanding your mental health because those go hand in hand and i just love that you just explained it right there everything it is all there whatever you were dealing with in your childhood is going to show up in your relationships and it, it and people don't want to talk about it. So when you show up to the first date, it's like all smiles. He's fine. Oh my goodness, he got a good job, a good car, and everything. And oh, I yeah. hit the jackpot. And then you turn around and you're like, wait, your mental health ain't good, right? And you can't find the right outfit to match your mental health because your, your <laughs> outfit is, is, is yeah is nice, but your brain is is not together. It's not. It's not. And I, like I mean, that. yes. That's and true. I've suffered with depression and anxiety. So I know, and I had to understand what mental things I was going through just based on some of the things that I dealt with growing up for sure. Yeah. Yep. So we definitely all need to, and I'm not saying that a person who suffers with mental Ill illness doesn't deserve love because, right. because we all do. Yes. We all suffer yes, from anxiety true. and depression at some points in our life, yes. whether it's clinical or, or situational, we all struggle on some level, but I feel like we all need to be mindful. Yes. You know, I think a lot of times people feel like, oh, well, you're so young, you don't know. But if we start people off young, being more intentional, being self-aware of where you are in life and to bring on or another person, bring a person into your life and you're not ready for that person, all you can and all you will probably do is inflict, you know, abuse. You may want to consider like, if I'm not good to myself, mm -hmm. how can I be good to somebody else? Yes, and I think exactly. that needs to be communicated all across the board. And like I said, you know, with the Christian community, I understand the importance of, you know, you know, the message of he who finds a wife finds a good thing. I understand that message. Mm -hmm. However, in addition to that message, there needs to be some, other conversations around, you know, when once she, once he finds you, you got some questions to ask, yes, right? Yes. And not that you're interrogating, <laughs> not that you're judging, but you do have at some point you need to be asking the right questions mm -hmm. so you're not blindsided. Yeah. Yeah. So talk more. Okay. So you ex encountered all this abuse. It sounds like there's a lot of mental. He was a bully. Yeah. This person was a mm -hmm. straight up bully, and then like just controlling. And it had to make you, in terms of your self-worth, how did you start feeling about yourself? I felt not wanted. I felt not loved. I felt I felt really low. I noticed that my weight was dropping. I was already a slender, you know, slender, mm -hmm. but I noticed my weight was dropping. I noticed that I just didn't have a drive. I wasn't happy. Mm -hmm. I kind of just started to stick to myself, you know, go to work, come. Now, by this time, I'm actually going to my parents' house now because I didn't, you know, I wasn't going to the apartment anymore. But it was like, well, at that moment, I wasn't going to the apartment because he already had pretty much said, you know, we're just going to be friends. But I was lonely. I was lonely. I felt used. I felt like, where do I go from here? And and still, I was still wrapped up in his situation. You know, like I said, as we go deeper, I was still wrapped up in it, you know. Yeah. But that's how I felt about myself, though. I was, I was at a very low space in my life. Yeah. And so I want to go back a little bit, and we'll come back to that. Mm-hmm. 
But you were saying you were getting, he, you know, there was visi visi visible signs mm -hmm. of abuse. Like yes. you say, it was on your arms, yep. on your legs. And usually, you know, a person who abuses a person, they make sure they hit spots and a person can't see. So they don't, mm -hmm. I don't know if he ever touched your face. No, not my face. It was, yeah, yeah just yeah. my arm and my legs. Places that you mm -hmm. could actually cover up. And then were, were you covering it up? Yeah, that, that time, that, that would have to be like the worst. And like I said, I ended up wearing like a long sweater and some pants. And I was wearing all black that day because I just felt, that's how I felt. <laughs> like I, and, and at the time I was going to my retail job, so we can kind of dress a little casual. So that day I just decided to wear all black. I just mm -hmm. wore a black sweater, some black slacks. I went to work and I just was in a zone. Mm -hmm. I just was zoned out because I think I was just so confused about where is this relationship going, you know, at the time. Because at the time I was still at the apartment when this had happened. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was like, I actually have a bruise from this. Mm -hmm. And why do I have a bruise? And I mean, it wasn't because I bruised easy. It was more so because somebody was hitting on me. Right. You know, I had to really start to understand what was going on. Yeah. Was this mm -hmm. the first time that he had left marks on you? Yes. This this was the first time. Okay. This was the first time. So did it give you ha having those visible signs for yourself? Like you mm -hmm. said, you had the memory of it, but now you're looking at it. You're like, this has gone too far. Yeah. The first hit has gone too far. Yeah, it was unreal. The first you know, call out your name, mm -hmm. being called out your name has gone too far, yeah. right? Yeah. So we kind of measure what abuse is, but that's abuse. Yeah. So you saw the visible signs. Mm -hmm. What was, what did you say to yourself? What what shifted in you when you saw the visible signs that you're, you're, you're an abused woman? Oh man. I just, I think for me, it was still the, it was still the shock, but I was hurting inside because I've never been hit like this before. And it still brung back, I think it brung back the whole situation with him also, you know, with me not taking the morning after pill because we thought I could be pregnant. It just took me back to the fact like he doesn't care about me at all. No matter what he says, he doesn't care at all because who would hurt somebody that they say that they love? That's right. It didn't add up. Right. So those are the things that were, you were processing. Yep. Yep. Looking um, at that. And it was like, you know, you look at the marks and you're sitting over there like, but love is different than this. Like you shouldn't be hurting. You shouldn't be in pain if someone says, I love you. You right. know, it just didn't make sense to me. So you, did he, you know, seeing that he had gone too far, was it a, for him, did he kind of take a step back and say, oh, I'm sorry? Did he ever apologize? Like, oh, I've gone too far. That was another thing that I was going to mention, too. The times that he's ever said sorry was probably like twice to me mm -hmm. out of the situation. He wasn't the person to really say sorry. He wasn't like he was more of the person to might be like, you know, you'll be OK. It ain't that big of a deal. But out of. The two times I can really, well, maybe only just one time I can really remember, but I would say I'll give him two, probably twice of him actually apologizing and saying he was sorry. But now it was more so with the events that happened, it was like, he didn't mean that either. You know, he didn't really mean that. He just said it just to, you know, just to say it. It yeah. wasn't, I don't think it was any real meaning behind it. Mm -hmm. So did you... Okay, so that, you know, you experienced that. Mm -hmm. Did, so you went back, you still stayed with them. Well, this is, yeah, so this is what ended up happening. So real quick, I because I know it's a lot, mm -hmm. <laughs> but he ended up, so he ended up asking back for the key. I This gave, was after the, the, alter, the abuse? Yeah, this was, this was after, yeah, I had already, when he had hit me and stuff like that, after seeing the bruises and stuff, this is when we were living together. Mm -hmm. So now coming back to when he finally asked for the key and stuff back. So, so can you pause for just a moment? I yeah. just want to make sure our listeners understand. Yes. So when you were hit, yeah. you went to work, right? Yeah. You covered mm -hmm. yourself up. Mm -hmm. You went, you were still living there. Yeah, so this you, is when I was still living you're there. You're still living there. Yeah. So you come back into the home. He hadn't asked you to leave yet. No, I hadn't asked so me to leave yet. So can you speak to coming back home? Just first, can you speak to coming back home and what that was like? Seeing that you had kind of 
separated mm-hmm. from him. You have mm-hmm. he probably went somewhere, you went somewhere, you had to work. What was the interaction like when you got back home as you saw the visible marks of mm-hmm. abuse? What was your interaction like with him? It was it was just regular. It was normal. It it was almost like it didn't happen. Okay. It was almost like whatever. You know what I'm saying? In his head, he probably felt, oh, he was wrestling or tussling or whatever, but he basically was getting his aggression out on me. That was how that that's really what I mean, it was back to normal with him. A lot of situations that would happen, like even when he jumped on my stomach. Oh, the next day was back to normal. It was like, all right, we back to regular work schedule. It was no really concern, understanding you okay. I don't remember any of that, like, concern in that moment. It was just, oh, we're back to daily. You know, he goes to work, I go to work, might come back home, watch some TV, you know, just regular routine. So it yeah. was back to normal. You, yeah, it was You back didn't to say normal. anything either. I didn't, yeah, I was, at this point, I'm like, you know what? I got to guard myself because I'm in a situation. So I was trying to basically watch my words, watch my steps, like, because mm-hmm. I didn't know where it was going to go. Like a ticking but, time. Yeah, bro. but it was normal for him. It was but, just back to normal. Okay. But, but at this point, you weren't trying to leave. You No, at that okay. point, I wasn't trying to leave until the situation comes up where he did ask for the key back. Yeah. Okay. But it was him that asked. It wasn't yeah. you saying, right. you know what, let me get myself out of no, this No, it was him. Yep, it was him. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I guess I just wanted to make yeah. sure no, that, our listeners that, yeah. understood that yeah. you did go back but a lot of times people can't, that's because the way he kind of was very casual about it, yeah. it sounded like you kind of follow suit. Mm-hmm. Again, you're young, wanting to be a relationship. I want to, you know, reiterate that mm-hmm. you wanted to make things work because that's how you saw, you know, your yeah. parents do. Although yeah. you didn't see confrontation, but you wanted to make things work. So it wasn't anything in you that said, you know what, this, I got to leave. This ain't right. Right, right. I think, and I think another thing is, the way he would word stuff, like I said, it was that point of he tried to make it look like it was just a wrestling. Like, we were just play fighting. This is, you know, you got to toughen up and blah, blah, blah. But in my head, that would always play with my mind. Because I'm like, well, what if he's not really serious? Like, what if this is... And then I would go back, like you said, looking at my arm. And I'm like, but this isn't love. But what if he just didn't mean to be that hard on me? You know, I think it was the the back and forth in my mind trying to justify it, trying to make it seem like, well, maybe it wasn't as bad as I'm making it. Like I said, once I really started to journal back and write down the stuff and really understand, like, no, you were abused. It probably really kicked into me like, no, this is nothing to downplay here, you know? But I think it was just that back and forth in my mind. Right. So just trying to justify it. Because again, at that time, your motto was to stay, 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 stay. So Make it work. Make it work. Make it work. Make it work. You're this deep. Make it work. Yeah, this deep. (laughs) He's going to be okay. You know, I said, like I said, his mom, his mom was a pure angel to me. Like she was so nice. I just didn't, didn't understand where his anger was coming from. And she came just being so nice. Like I said, we would we even went to lunch together and stuff. So it was like, there's hope for him because I see how his mom is. You know, I see how she is. And I just couldn't put the two. I couldn't understand, like, he's acting like this, but where did it come from? And I know that he didn't have, like, his mom and his dad, they weren't together. So, of course, that was probably a whole nother side that I didn't know about. But just seeing how she carried herself, Mm -hmm. I just was confused. Like, how is he acting like this? But she's so peaceful, calm, you know, loving. I didn't understand. Yeah. So yeah. seeing that, seeing that in his mother, that gave you hope. Right. That, that he there's something. Better. Yeah. But we already know that again, when we go back to Christianity yes. or just yes. people in general, <laughs> just because they present a certain way on the surface, yes. the 90%, as we talk about the mm-hmm. 90%, the 90% represents people's story. But I can understand why at a young woman, mm-hmm. you wouldn't be able to, to, to kind of, think on those lines right right right, you're not able to do that of course you are now but back then you know you're young you're not necessarily thinking about you know a person's history their background but how do but i think the important thing is is for our young people we don't want to make age the reason for ignorance right Right. we want to be able to say let's let's educate our young people Mm -hmm. if you're in a situation this is what love is this is what it's not right yes this is how you should feel 
This is how you should not not. feel. Right. Right. So I think this podcast and you telling your story is so very important because you were a young woman at the time and then you kept it quiet. Yes. You didn't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. So, so he, let's, let's, Bad. Let's go back. We're gonna go back and forth. Mm-hmm. But he asked you for the. So you, at some point, he asked you to leave. Yes, he asked okay. for the key back. And so this is when I'm starting to process everything in my mind because now it's like, oh, you want the key back? Now, even with the whole iron situation, I think we kind of touched on that also. As far as me kind of looking through the phone and hinting to the fact that there is somebody that he's in communication with. Mm-hmm. So now bringing it back forward. I give back my key and now it's more so to a point of me not officially leaving, but we weren't together, but now we're a friendship, right? And I'm still paying the rent at the apartment. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm still paying the rent at the apartment because at the end of the day, it's like my name is on the lease. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to cover myself. So I'm, I'm basically just proceeding as normal. He gets to a place where it's like, oh, I'll call you when I want you to come out here, you know, or just to chill with me or whatever the case may be. So now we're back to another control level. You coming out here tonight, you going to spend the night. So now I'm going to a place where I'm off and on spending the night. But then here comes Facebook. Like I said, because at the time when me, me and him first met, it was, like I said, MySpace. So I had a Facebook, but of course, Facebook at the time was just slowly getting popular. I happened to be on Facebook and I noticed these pictures that were posted. I guess they went to Cedar Point. They got on matching outfits. Yes, him and the the girl. This is a new girl. When he kicked you out, he moved somebody else. Right, and I find this all out through Facebook when I officially find this out. So I'm coming to spend the night off and on, but not every night. Mm -hmm. Whoever this new girl is officially moves in. So that's when I slowly am in the back background because I didn't know anything about this this female anyways I ended up looking on Facebook they went to Cedar Point together got matching outfits on Mm. then turned around and I dig deeper I think what made me dig deeper is I clicked because you know how like you can tag somebody Mm -hmm. I think what happened was I clicked on her page because he's not going to post everything she will so I looked I was, oh my goodness. I was so confused. I looked, I said, this is my apartment. That's my bed. That's my dresser. I said, wait a minute. She got, I mean, she moved in. I'm saying she moved in clothes, shoes, everything. Like you could tell it was a full stock. And, And so when we first got the apartment, we went through Gardner White. He got half of the furniture. I got the other half. So we fully furnished the apartment very nice. So I'm looking at all these pictures she's taken in the apartment and I'm like, oh wow, this is the girl who moved in, who he probably had been talking to in communication with. He kicked me out so he can move her in. And so then he sends me to come every now and then to to play house when, right. Or well, before she officially moved in, I feel like she was probably coming out to the apartment too, but then they must've had some form of connection. We're together. Of course is what I'm thinking. He must've gave her the fairy tale. He gave me we're together, blah, blah, blah. Now she's moved in. So now I got a problem because I'm like, I'm paying half of the rent here and now she's moved in. Mm -hmm. So now it gets deeper. Then all of a sudden, within the time that she moved in, I get a phone call. Hey, I need you to come out here. I'm like, well, what's going on? Man, she crazy. She crazy. I said, oh, the girl on Facebook, the girl who you technically moved me out to move her in. Yeah, I done had to get security and stuff like that, you know, up front because now she over here trying to break in and blah, 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 and all of this other stuff. So I'm guessing... Karma. And within the right, <laughs> reap what you sow. Karma saw. all over again. So now she's I crazy. Not, I shouldn't laugh. Yeah, no, but, but no, that's, but what, that's it what it is. is. Yeah, so that's he met what his, it is. He met his twin. Yeah, that's what it is. So now I'm sneaking out here to the apartment late at night, sneaking to your apartment, to my apartment. Cause I don't know what this girl gonna do. You see me, you might think I'm no, that's not what we're doing. So now he had to go through the whole process of making sure she got her stuff back or whatever, however they did it, whatever. So now she's officially out the picture again. And who is back? Me. 
Now, I'm not officially back once again because he still had the key. But now I'm trying to help him get out of this situation with another female that you moved in. Knowing good and well, I'm paying the rent. So she wasn't paying nothing, clearly. But I'm sure she he gave this perception of this is my place, you know, and blah, blah, blah. I gave her the whole script and stuff. So now she falls in. But now he just didn't know she was crazy. So anyways... We get further into the situation. I'm coming out there, you know, whatnot. And 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 then down the line, something happens with his job. He's laid off. So now I'm really in full motion or full motion. Now he has to, you know, do unemployment. And now I'm jumping in because he was working at a, a factory where they were making parts for semis. And so, of course, within the factory type, you have those moments where you get laid mm-hmm. off or something may happen. So now mm-hmm. he's really leaning in. He's really leaning in. I'm trying to help the best that I can still trying to, you know, be there for him and paying still my half of the rent because I don't want nothing falling on me. I'm like, my name is on the lease. That's That's all I kept thinking. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Now we get further and further into the story. He decides out of nowhere, I'm cutting the lease. What do you mean? What do you mean you cutting the lease? Like we have only a few more months of the lease, but because of the job situation, then he decided he was going back to school. So now he's looking at it like it's getting tight and then he ends up cutting the lease. Now, what I did notice also when I came back into the apartment after he had dealt with baby girl who was crazy is that he also punched a hole in the wall. So now we got to pay you're for on, this. Yeah, you're on the hook for that. We got to pay for this. Why you punched a hole in the wall, I don't know. Because you're because now we know you're abusive. Of course, you probably was pulling the same thing on, on her or mm-hmm. y'all must have gotten into an altercation. That's yeah. why she went crazy. Whatever the case may be. But now I'm like, so we got a hole in the wall. We got to figure out. Now you want to cut the lease. Mm-hmm. We go through this whole process of now he's jumping from back to his mom's to apartment i'm not apartments but to him looking for other apartments him trying to get me to be the co-signer on other apartments he was going to hotels having to stay at a hotel here or there then he ended up moving whichever one came first he moved with either his dad first and then his mom i want to say so he was in between so i'm helping him through all of this we're trying to navigate where are you going to be at? Where are you going to stay? Got to get a U-Haul, move your stuff here, move your stuff there. Me, on the other hand, I had to basically give all of my stuff away as far as the furniture that I paid for. So some of the furniture went to his mom. Some of the furniture, I was able to take like a dresser and a nightstand to my house yeah. because my mom and them already had their stuff at the house. Yeah. So I couldn't bring my stuff there. So I basically lost all of my furniture and came back with a dresser and a nightstand. So by then, my parents knew that I had an apartment. Yeah, well, stuff let me like ask that. you this, because I really want to I really want to understand, why did you feel, you know, an obligation to your abuser? Why did you feel an obligation to help him? I felt like I, just that being caring, being caring, being understanding, and even though I wasn't his girlfriend anymore, I just was willing to help. And I felt Like that was my place to help. I didn't have to, Mm -hmm. you know, and it was still, I think the form of him pulling me in, you know, sometimes he would still pull me back in and make me feel like, oh, maybe there's a chance. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why. I think that's why. Because you still had a longing to be with him. Yeah, I still, I still felt like somewhere in there, it could be a chance somewhere there is a chance. And so when he would have those moments of being nice and kind, it pulled me back in. Mm-hmm. Then he'll show the moments of this other side where it's like angry, mad, upset. Mm-hmm. But when he broke the lease, I was like, okay, he can't be out on the street. You know, let's try to figure it out. I'm here to help. I'm your friend now, you know? So that's kind of why I jumped in. But a lot mm-hmm. of times think about this. So Mom is nice, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Mom is a woman of faith. Yep. He meet, and a lot of times what happens is, and I don't know them at all, but we have a tendency sometimes to coddle our men too long, right? Yeah. We don't hold them accountable at times. So we don't tell them that your behavior, we don't, ne- we don't necessarily communicate your behavior is un- un- not acceptable 
and I'm not going to tolerate it. So part of that consequence, I'm not going to deal with you. Mm -hmm. So his mother probably took the same approach, right? Mm -hmm. When you think about somebody who has a good, solid foundation, as you see, right? right? But then at the same time, you're not holding this man accountable Mm -hmm. to be a good person, to contribute in a way that's valuable to society, treating women right. So sometimes we can mold and shape just people in general, but in this case, we can mold our men to be self-serving, to be, you know, it's all about me. I like mm-hmm. to call them soloists. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to consider the other person. Mm-hmm. So mom sounded like she probably, let's, say, let's just say mom did that, right? right? Mm-hmm. Not hold him accountable. So there's no real incentive to be better. There's mm-hmm. no real reason to be different, better, or what have you, because I'm still going to get what I need from you. Right. There are mm-hmm. no real consequences. Then here you come. Yep. The same thing. Mm-hmm. I'm not really going to hold you accountable. Mm-hmm. You can abuse me. You can say this. You can say that. I am still going to be here. So there's really no incentive to be better. Yes. Because I'm still going to get rewarded with your time, your solutions, your energy, your your the good nature that uh-huh. you you have. Like I said, your your spirit is just so beautiful. So I can oh, see why someone <laughs> would want to be around you. But does that person deserve? to right. be around you. Right. So it sounds like, you know, again, if let's just say mom was that way, here you are mm-hmm. feeling like an obligation to this person who has abused you in many ways. Yes. Yes. That's exactly what it was. And like you said, it could have been, like I said, I don't know the dynamic of their relationship for sure, but had it been like that, he was probably used to getting his way. You could tell that he's used to having nice things. He was so big on the outfits that he wore, the watches that he wears, the the cars that he drives. It has to be the neighborhood that he lives in. Even when he was trying to find another apartment, it was like, I can't stay here. I got to have this. I got to stay in these certain areas. And it was like, he just wanted to have that look. He wanted to be that man. It was so much. And it was all about him. It was all about his presentation. And that's another thing that I feel like us as ladies, we got to look out for that. The presentation, like I said, he would show up. He would dress nice anytime he was getting ready to go out or whatever the case may be. Dress nice, always had on a watch, always took care of how he smelled, was very detailed in all of that. But the inside was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was crazy. Okay. So that's, that's a very good point that you make. So at what point, because we got to move on to, yeah, yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. at what point did you end things? When did you have enough? Oh, wow. So another layer of the story, which we're going to, anyways, what ended up happening is that my check starts to get garnished. I started to get garnished and I noticed when I looked at my check, because of the fact that he filed bankruptcy Mm. and didn't tell me so number one he kept saying something hinting to the fact like i might have to file bankruptcy because whatever jam he was in Mm -hmm. now he can't get an apartment he's going like i said he's living with other people or and trying to figure it out so i'm getting garnished and now he's calling he called up to my job one day Now, I don't know exactly what made him feel like, because I wasn't, I don't think I was answering my phone. I think this is how it happened. I wasn't answering my phone because now I'm looking at it like I'm getting garnished. This is deeper. Now I got to, now I'm looking at it like I got to start taking care of me. Mm -hmm. You got to figure it out. We started really distance, like at a distance or whatever. So now I'm looking at it like, okay, I'm getting garnished. Like, what is going on? And I remember, I I think in that moment, I might have reached out to him. But like I said, I, I think what happened the day that he called my job was kind of like it for me, you know. But I think I did let him know that they were garnishing my check. And so we were going to come up with some form of arrangement. This is what kind of how it was going to go. You know, okay, I, you know, I understand. I filed bankruptcy, blah, blah, blah. Then later down the line, he calls my job. And now he's on the phone with the lady who works the customer service desk. And she says, somebody's on the phone with you. They ended up calling me to the front. I take the phone call. It's him yelling, screaming, you won't pay me my money, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, how do I owe you anything when you're the one who filed for bankruptcy? They're coming after me. Oh, you're going to make sure you got my money, blah, 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 all of this other stuff. I said, this is crazy. Like, this is crazy. Power and control. So 
in between all of that, he ends up getting into another relationship. And this is all in the midst of around this time. He's already moved on to another relationship. He ends up having a daughter. He had no problem sending me a picture of his newborn daughter and how excited he was for this new relationship and all of this other stuff. But in between all of that, I decide, okay, he was reaching out to me. I guess him and the girl were no longer together. I guess. I'm going to just put I guess. But by this time, he has a child. Anyways, he we decided to meet up. My whole point of meeting up was to try to get my money because my check is getting garnished. I'm not making that much. So I was hoping in hopes of us having the conversation. I go to the apartment that he's staying in and we are having a conversation. He then turns into trying to make this a physical encounter. I said, oh, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. This is not the situation. I'm sorry. I didn't come over here for that. I'm coming over there thinking that we were going to have a conversation. He made it sound like we was going to hang out or chill, whatever the case may be. Now, mind you, in my head, I'm like, this is very wrong, but I want my money back because at this time it's getting serious. Mm -hmm. So anyways, to make a long story short, this is what really made the situation end. He was showing me around the new apartment that he stayed in. Now, mind you, I'm not sure if, if if another girl was staying there or not, because to my understanding, he broke up from the relationship of with his daughter's mom. This is what I'm assuming. I'm walking around, looking. He was showing me the apartment. He was so excited because I guess it was just an upgrade and all of that. And so he showed me his daughter's room. Yeah, this is her room. And I'm in there looking in his daughter's room. He walks out the room. He comes back. And he's pointing a gun at me. And he's like, so just so I can give a little backstory, in between me being over there, having this conversation, he was talking about, I want you to move back. I want you to move over here with me, take over the lease and blah, blah, blah. So this had me in my head, just the structure of how he's been operating, that there was a girl, either his ex-girlfriend or his baby mother, must have been living there. She doesn't live there anymore. Now he has to resume the responsibilities of the rent. And now he wants me to move in to take over the rent. This is what I'm starting to equal how he's using women. I'm like, this is how he does it. And I said, you know, I I can't do that. I said, I'm not moving back over here. I was like, because now he's at a new apartment, but I'm just saying, I'm not moving back with you. Is basically what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And when he walked into the room and pointed the gun at me and he said, you said, you're not going to do what? And I turned around oh my and I saw the gun. And in my head, he tried to play it off like he was playing. And this time I said, I got to get out of here. I grabbed my stuff. I said, you know what? It's all good. I said, because in my head, the conversations that I was going to get a little deeper on, hey, you know, can can we work out something with this apartment situation? I didn't even care no more. Yeah. I got my stuff. And he said, well, you know, I'm just playing. I said, no, because the last time in my head, I'm like, the last time you said you was playing, you hit me. The last time you want to joke around and be wrestling with me, I had bruises. You got a gun, you might shoot me. I got to go. I grabbed my stuff. I sat in the car. So he allowed you to leave freely. Yeah, he allowed me to leave. I, I, I took my stuff. You know, I kind of had to play it off. Like, oh, okay, you know. I'm going to go, <laughs> I'm going to go, you know, kind of lightly laughing so that he wouldn't think anything of it. I'm going to go, you know, I sat in my car and I said, it, it was nothing but God, the reason why I'm not in this situation no more. I just was like, you pointed a gun at me yeah, and wow. you said that you were playing, but I know better now. I got to get out of here and I left Yeah, and I left and when he found out, you know, he tried to low key, you know, reach out to me here or there and I was shutting it down and I ended up in another relationship. Okay. So and, did you file a personal protection order? So again, I want us to move mm-hmm. forward. So the day that he pulled the gun on him for intimidation, that power control yeah. will that we talked about mm-hmm. because he felt like he's going to intimidate you and he knew the pattern of you coming back. Yes. You he staying. knew that would have. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
So this time there was a no. It was a no. You stopped. It was a definite that no. was that was the end of the relationship. Yep, that was the end. Okay. That was the official end. And like I said, this was in the course of two years. Two years. Yes. It because by the time he ended up, like I said, it was so much in between. Mm-hmm. But by the time he broke the lease. Like I said, him trying to find an apartment, him moving back and forth with different people and all of this stuff, then me getting garnished, because it took a minute for the garnishment to kick in once he left the apartment, because he didn't pay nothing on the apartment, so all that back rent was owed up. So now I'm getting garnished and he's free in the clear. Okay. You know, I filed bankruptcy. I'm good. Well, now they're coming after me because I'm the one yeah. who, you know. Yeah. So what did you, can we... Yeah. Mm-hmm. So where did you learn from that experience? Like being the mature woman and more self-aware, mm-hmm. what did you get out of that situation? How has it changed you? What I took from the situation was, and this is the, the biggest thing, is that when you notice that someone puts that first hit, that first strike, that 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 first red flag that you notice something isn't right, the the arguing i noticed that now who i am now that is unacceptable mm-hmm. do not stay do not stay i don't care how many times somebody says i love you i'm going to be there for you i care for you you have to go you have to go because that day he pulled the gun out on me could have been my last day that could have been your last and i kept sticking it out caring and stuff so like I said, I now being 37, I understand that that was no longer acceptable for me. And it probably caused more trauma in my dating after that, which I'm sure, you know, a lot of the guys will say, yeah, dating you was a little rough. And I'm, you know, but I got better. But what I'm saying is trying to date after that what, what was, was that hard. Like? I was, I was in fear of making the wrong decision. I was in fear of the person showing up and being a wrong representation of themselves. Oh, the trust. Yeah, the trust. Tr- I didn't trust. I didn't know. I was scared to to be who I was. I was scared to be open and honest. I was scared to be verbal because I felt like it was going to cause an argument. It was going to be some form of back and forth. Yep. Yeah. And so dating after that was hard. It was okay. definitely hard for me. Okay. But the takeaway from it was... If you notice the signs early on, it's time to go. Yeah. It's no staying. And I think like you said, the withholding food or yeah. talking about your weight, yeah. those things are, and I think people, they're, they're subtle, you know, because it, well, actually not even subtle. It's it looks odd. small though. It looks small at first because you would well, think. Well, for a person to talk about, you can't eat this, you can't eat that. I shouldn't even say that's subtle because to Mm. me, that's, I guess it depends on, again, like we talk about red flags. Mm. I think for me, that would be a red flag of someone saying, you can't, you can't eat this. You got to wear your hair this way. You got to dress this way. To me, that power and control will that we talk about, Mm. you know, that would be a red flag to me. So no, I definitely get that. And when I say Mm -hmm. small, I think it's because we think of as abuse as he socked me, he slapped me. I think a lot of people take that and look at the, the holy grail to abuse. Mm-hmm. But no, it's it's the small, you can't eat this. You need to just eat honey buns because you need to gain weight. That is abuse. And I think some women don't notice that. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what I would say as far as looking at all aspects of it. Like it's the small, the medium, the big, it's all of it. It's yeah. not just one, you know, layer. Because it's a buildup. Yes, it's a buildup. It's up. a buildup. Mm-hmm. So like you said, Angie, you said your relationships after that, you were very guarded. You yes. were very on alert. You trauma, know, trauma. 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 Um, trauma field. Today, where are you with your relationships? Are you in a relationship? Yes. I'm currently in a relationship. And I would definitely say it's a relationship that I pray for. Mm. And I see a real man. I see a real example of a real man and how he treats me, how he treats the kids. And it's a total opposite. But I learned from the situation that there are good men out there. And even though I went through the trauma and had to go through the healing process, and that's a whole other story, but there is good men out there, you know? And so... I just want to give hope to women who might have been abused, understand, and men, that there is still hope. 
you know. There are good men mm-hmm. and women out there who who think like you, yeah. who want mm-hmm. the best, who want to offer up their the best version of themselves. So though, that that story, like I said, the, the build up to that, if you had to, and I know you've spoke to this, but I really want you to drive it home again in terms of you had, if you had to speak to someone who's in a situation, a young girl or an older person who's in a situation like this, Mm -hmm. what would you say to them? I would say the key is to number one, love yourself because I felt like I operated in a space of not loving who I was. I didn't really care for how I looked. I didn't care for, it was so much about me that I felt like I wanted to fix. And so I came damage to men that knew what they could get away with and and being able to manipulate me and use me and had I had that self-love and awareness for myself I wouldn't have let them get that far yeah so do you have kids yourself yes I do yeah who do you have a girl I have well I have a daughter she was from a a past relationship Mm -hmm. and then I have a son and also a bonus daughter. So, okay. Three so kids. what would you, so you got two girls, you know, yeah. so like you said, cause it happened to men too. Mm-hmm. What would you say to them to make sure that they're not like you in the situation? Like you said, first love yourself. That's mm-hmm. so important, but just leading by example, wouldn't you say, cause your new relationship, you said is a healthy, you said it's a healthy yes, relationship. Healthy. Yeah. He respects you. You respect him. It yep. sounds like, so you've, you've got your partner, you got your yeah. person. All these years, starting when you yes. said sixth grade, yes, <laughs> and you said this yes. is gonna be the one. This, this is gonna, gonna be, be the one. I can't. I, it, woo, I think it was what, rough. You, what you said, and you said, oh, I li- when I listen back to <laughs> what we talked about in part one, you said all relationships all of count. Them count, and you Everyone. are absolutely right. <laughs> Every last one of them count because it's a building block into just emotional and social competency, and ter- especially if you take it that way. Yes, this is mm-hmm. an opportunity for me to learn some things about my, myself because it's through our interaction with each other yes. that we learn things about ourselves. Yes. And if people are paying attention, about like, ooh, I'm this way, so you learn. Although that relationship was very abusive. It's not a waste because I'm sure you learned mm-hmm. so much about yourself yes. that you can impart to your kids, mm-hmm. be the example, and really choosing the the right mate for you. Mm-hmm. So yep. I think I think that's awesome. Yes. Any <laughs> final words before we end? Yes, I just want to say just to anyone who's listening to this story, just understand that there is a end to a abusive situation. There is the hope for better if you want better. And I always say, make sure that you let someone know, even if you feel like you're uncomfortable with letting authorities know, they always have hotlines. They always have, you know, if you feel comfortable with someone, let somebody know so that they can be able to keep in touch with you and reach out to you. So I definitely feel like that there is an end to it. And there's always hope for better. You know, as long as you want better, there's hope for better. You are absolutely right, Angie. And again, I thank you so much for sharing your story and just building community around this topic, because a lot of times people don't want to talk about it. Um, So I do want to give out a number. It's the Domestic Abuse Intervention Project. Uh, The number is, let me see here, it's uh, 218-722- 4134. Again, that number is 218-722-4134. And I'm going to put more information about, you know, who you should contact if you're in a situation where you're being abused and you don't know where to turn. I'll put more information in the context of this uh, podcast. But again, Angie, thank you so much for sharing thank your story. You. I feel honored that you would choose uh, Behind the 90 with Nika podcast to share your story. So thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me and letting me tell my story. Absolutely. Thanks for joining today's episode. If you enjoyed the story time, don't forget to subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and we're also on YouTube. Leave us a review and share with your friends to help us reach more listeners. Stay tuned for more insightful stories. Until next time, take care and keep exploring new connections with us.